that kind of being flustered is the sort of thing you'll be able to avoid once you're trained as an improviser. Um, okay, uh, and this thing doesn't have my slide notes on there, so I'm going to be uh, going from the noggin, and we'll see how that goes. Um, so yeah, this talk is called A Food Walks Into a Bar, Programming Meets Improv, uh, an incongruous mesh, if ever there was one. Uh, but let's press on and find out exactly how ludicrous this proposition is. Um, I am a programmer. Uh, my name is Dan Wormsley. I am the VP of Engineering of a company called Nation Builder. Um, uh, which is why I exude an air of authority and competence, uh, <laughs> no matter what I'm doing. Um, and so, you know, as the leader of that organization, I've had to build a team uh, of 12 marvelous people, um, a quarter of which aren't fired. Um, and, uh, and, I, and I've had sort of like, you know, like obviously do lots of interviews and like, you know, scale the infrastructure and, and all the typical challenges um, that people have in these positions. Um, so I'm also an improviser. Um, I started uh, doing improv in about the year 2000. Prior to that, I did sketch comedy for a few years, and I, I decided that I would try to do improv as a way of kind of becoming a better performer, becoming a more confident sort of stand-up and and, and, um, and sketch performer. And what I what I didn't expect, but what happened is I actually, after sort of five years of doing improv, became an entrepreneur, um, and became a, like a better collaborator and a better programmer as a result of having the skills that I had, the soft skills of like dealing with people and situations that come up all the time as a programmer, because you know, it's so easy for us with our highly specialized technical knowledge uh, to end up in a world in which you know, it's, it's hard to solve problems with non-programmers or you know, uh, you know, divergent views within a programming team and strong opinions can sometimes stall things. So I'm gonna just dive into how some of the improv skills I learned came into play in, in my professional life. Uh, so first of all, what is improv? Um, Hands up if you think you know what improv is. Okay, that's cool. Uh, yeah, most of you are probably thinking of like you know the whose line is it anyway improv where you know people get up on stage and they do short sketches and they're given some suggestions and some restrictions. So we'll dive into that. So we have suggestions. Um, you know, so you get from the audience like um, maybe someone suggests it's a car salesman and they're at the bottom of the ocean. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you have restrictions, so maybe the, the MC of the night says, you have to do it all in song. Um, and so, you know, you're, now you're doing a musical about selling a car at the bottom of the sea. Um, and then there's a story element uh, where you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not enough to inhabit the scene. You've got to actually, like, find a way to close out the scene, you know, in an amount of time that doesn't feel, like, not entertaining to the audience. Uh, although I have done a 36-hour show once. That was fun. Um, <laughs> Uh, didn't, didn't have a story though, um, but lots of uh, chocolate coated coffee beans. Um, so <laughs> let's delve into some of the rules of improv. Uh, some of the, you know, because a lot of people think, well, improv is just like talented people getting up on stage and making up stuff and they're just naturally funny and they're naturally, you know, they're trained as comedians or whatever. But it turns out that like improv, uh, mercifully for a programmer like me, uh, has a whole bunch of fairly strict rules that you have to adhere to, and these rules actually increase the likelihood that you'll be entertaining, that you'll finish the scene, that you'll apply the restrictions and the suggestions, uh, and that everyone will walk away happy. So the first rule is don't deny, which has a sort of counterpoint, which is like always say yes and. Um, now, imagine that we're in a situation where like you and your colleagues are talking about um, you know, a particular technical approach. Should we use Postgres or MongoDB? Uh, and you know, someone someone suggests you can MongoDB. You just shut them down because you know it's crap for what you're trying to do. It's highly relational. It's this. It's that. So no, we're not going to use MongoDB. Um, and we've also all though been on the other side of that situation, where we've had what we think is the kernel of a genius idea, and someone else has said, no, we can't do it that way. It'll take too long. It'll be too expensive. You know, it's not what our customers want. It doesn't meet the needs of our application. Um, so. You know, it's always tempting to deny someone, but if you, if you always say yes and, you get a chance to get at the core of, of what that person is talking about. And how this works in, in improv is like, you know, you're out there, you're doing a scene, uh, someone says, oh, like, you know, I'm just going to shovel this sand. And they'll say, no, you can't shovel that sand, that's not a real shovel. And then they'll be like, oh, okay, then I'm just going to stand in the corner. Um, you know, by, by shutting someone's idea down, but like, you know, if someone was saying, oh, I'm going to shovel some sand, you're like, oh, I'm going to help, I'll also shovel sand. It sounds obvious and trivial, but by embracing what they do, now you're both happy sand shovelers and you can move on with the rest of the scene. Um, and by the way, that's a quote from Dick Costolo, CEO of Twitter. Uh, yeah, validated. Um, <laughs> so it's an article that actually came out the other day after I started writing this, uh, pretty cool. Um, he actually used to be an improviser in, I think, Chicago. 
Um, two, don't ask questions. What? How will we ever understand anything if we don't ask questions? Don't ask open-ended questions. You know, um, so um, actually for this, I'm actually, I told you I wouldn't pick on you, but I'm going to pick you up. Um, so for this, I'm going to get my volunteer, Jacob, um, to show you what happens if you're in a scene and, uh, you know, if you're trying to solve a problem and all you can do is ask questions. So, um, so uh, what's, what's like, um, what's a problem that might happen around the home? Change a light bulb. Change a light bulb. Okay. So we're going to try and change a light bulb, uh, but we can only speak in questions. Uh, and if we don't, uh, if we accidentally make a statement, you've got to go, rah, and we've got to end. Okay. Um, so let's just do it. Where are you? What did you see? Uh, what are you doing in my house? Who are you? <laughs> Can't you see I'm the guy whose light bulb blew out? That was a light bulb? Uh, <laughs> Intimation. Uh, <laughs> How do you know that it wasn't a light bulb? Who do you think I am? Are you the light bulb repair guy? You're not. Uh, <laughs> it's, very, it's very difficult. Thank you, thank you. Um, it's very difficult to, to solve anything when all you do is ask questions. And they, we've all we've all been there in meetings where like someone's kind of said, uh, you know, uh, well, you know, I think that we should, uh, you know, deploy every Friday, and, they, and then they're just like, oh, well, you know, why would you want to do that? Or what? You know, and, and instead of saying like. Oh, you know, let's dig into the benefits of that, or like, you know, like let's find out what that would involve, or let's, you know, if, if people are just constantly asking why, it stalls a conversation, um, and you know, especially open-ended questions where it's like, uh, you know, what, you know, why would we pair? It's like instead, let's just say like, what, like, let's discuss the benefits of pairing, and then it's sort of advanced to the scene. It's a little dubious, but um, I think this point works very well in improv and moderately well in day-to-day -day life. Um, uh, so yeah, don't be clever. Um, I think we've all, uh, well, let's, the improv version, right? So uh, in improv, everyone thinks, don't be clever has a counterpoint as well. It's like, don't, don't try to be funny. So people often will come to improv classes and they will, they will try to be funny they'll, and they'll feel bad if they're not constantly telling jokes. But it turns out that the thing that makes improvisers funny is that they're doing the next logical thing. They're actually stepping through a scene as logically as they can in the presence of these absurd restrictions, and that's what actually makes it funny. Sometimes they end up telling an actual joke, but I guarantee you it's never premeditated, and it's never because they're funnier than you. It's the kind of stuff that would actually just occur to you if you kind of like unleash your subconscious and just do the next logical thing in a scene. And the analogy in programming is like, don't try to gold plate the solution that you're doing. Um, oops, where are we? Don't be clever. Do the next obvious thing. Don't try to gold plate the solution that you're, you're implementing. Don't try and be a hero. Don't try and, and kind of give it a million features that you want to impress people with. Just implement you know, the, the things that are important to the customer um, rather than trying to be clever. And also, and I think that sort of, I'm guilty of this. I love new technologies, and I always want to implement the latest and greatest thing because I've seen it in some blog somewhere, and like I think I'm being really clever. Um, but then it ends up wasting a huge amount of time because you end up with this huge ball of like unknown crap to deal with. Um, so again, this applies in that situation. Uh, don't be a hero. This is um, this is my own way of phrasing it. It's typically phrased as like make other people look good. Um, so again, this this comes down to like not like trying to be the person that implements the most like sexy technical solution. Um, and it also applies even more so uh, when you're trying to, to pair or when you're trying to work in a small team. Um, if, if everyone's trying to make themselves look good, even subconsciously, this is not people who are arrogant or whatever, but it's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make myself look good, I'm gonna implement this thing by myself, uh, then I'm gonna bring it to everyone and it's gonna be this, this blaze of glory. Then you end up with people working in silos separately uh, and also, inevitably, you tread on each other's toes because you're not really communicating, you're focused on, on your own thing. Um, if you're focused on making other people look good, if you're saying, hey, like, you know, can I pair with you on this? Or, like, what are you working on? Being interested in that and helping to make their feature the best. If everyone's trying to do that, then the team will inevitably end up looking great. Does any, I mean, does anyone sort of feel okay about the, Yes? I was just thinking about that. It's like, that's almost the opposite of the Nash equilibrium. I don't know if you've studied game theory. Uh, but, but in the Nash equilibrium, it's almost the opposite, is that people are doing what's best for themselves, kind of like the prisoner's dilemma. Oh, right, yeah. And, and, and so, and, I, and I'm wondering if, if you kind of hit the nail on the head there with the, the, what, what goes wrong in a lot of places. Is yeah. That people are following the Nash equilibrium instead of the, I don't know, the wall yeah. thing. 
Yeah, well, Ayn Rand breaks down when you start to look at programming. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My thought is it's almost impossible to give other people too much credit. And yeah. the weird, there's sort of a weird sort of psychological thing. If you give other people credit all the time, people will assume that you're awesome. Right. It's like the most bizarre thing. Like, it is. No, no, no. These other people are awesome. Oh, you're such an, you're so modest. Yeah. Yeah. Mike really is awesome. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's like, it's like, but I mean, I, if, if somebody writes in with like, corrections to something, and I just broadcast, like, I didn't have anything to do with this. Like, someone else made this awesome, not me. Yeah. And uh, it's amazing that. It's, how it's, well that works. it's really true, and it's true. Like in, in internal in company, I mean, if you're provided your company doesn't have a poisonous culture that starts at the top, um, which I don't think any of us would claim to have that, um, uh, um, <laughs> then, uh, then, then you know, generally, people who make each other look good get rewarded. Like it, it is good politics in a sense to be always trying to make each other look good, and it builds positive energy in the company. And I think we can all feel that. Um, number five. Uh, of the five rules is tell a story. And so, you know, I alluded to this at the beginning, uh, you need to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. It's not enough just to be there. It's not even enough to sort of do all the, the sort of like restrictions and suggestions that people have given you. You have to find an ending quickly. And it's like actually one of the most important things. And I think in programming, it means like building the feature and finishing it with the smallest amount of code in the smallest amount of time with a focus on what the customer really needs. Um, rather than having this sort of like endless, like, oh, this feature's not released yet, but if I keep working on it a little bit longer, I can kind of add this other thing and this other thing and this other thing. Um, you know, there's time for that after the case, but finding a, telling a story, finding an ending quickly is really important. Um, it's one of the reasons why we do sprints and agile and all these other things, is like having a regular ship date, having a regular, like, full stop at the end of our sentence, pardon me, um, or a bunch of sputtering, um, find an ending. So those are the main five rules. These are an additional five rules that actually help the first five. So establishing context is really important in a scene. It means we're underwater, or we're at the top of a burning building, or we're in a helicopter. Um, in, in, in programming, it means like, you know, our, our customers are these people, we have this much money, you know, we have these many people in our team, you know, and, and this is what we're building on. You know, but it's like knowing your context, you know, you can't build Google. And no matter how much you want to, you just can't. Um, Google did. Weird. I think it fell through a rip from another dimension. But like, you know, let's let's be realistically about about what we're capable of with the specific problem we're trying to solve, uh, and go for that. Um, listening is super important. Um, you know, there's there's uh, how do I explain this? Yes, listening is super important. We all get it. Um, responding, like when you listen to someone, acknowledging what they suggested like actually kind of repeating it back to them helps you understand each other because like if someone says to you, oh, you know, I think we should, um, you know, do this in this way, uh, and like you may not have understood it. So by responding to it and showing that you understood it, maybe they'll tell you if you actually got it wrong. Um, uh, be specific. So rather than speaking in generality, generalities, be specific. That helps you kind of solve the technical problems you have now. Um, and in improv, being specific means you can ground the scene in a time and a place, and the other people in the scene have something to latch onto. They know who your character is and what its motivations is, rather than each of you going, no, who are you? No, who are you? I asked you first. Um, and then commit, which is, again, obvious, but it's like, given all those things, don't back out, push on through. Um, so yeah, um, any questions at this point about the things that I've been saying, or comments, or things that resonated, or things that didn't. No, lost you all. Start um, with why. It's a great video if you haven't seen that. As far as helping to establish the context. Yes. Particularly, uh, also going back to that telling the story. Yeah. And then, uh, respond. There's a technique known as active listening, which is an excellent series of styles to remain engaged with a person that you really are trying to understand and letting them know that. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, yep, yeah, good. I, oh. I, I, call on me after you. But. Sure. Um, yeah, I actually, I actually learned this from a friend. There's a, there's a thing called active listening, listening uh, that I think you were alluding to, uh, where someone says something to you and you say, what I think I heard was this. You repeat back to them the whole thing. And then you say, did I get that right? And then they say yes or no. Uh, and, then you, and then if they say no, you kind of fix that and you repeat it back to them. And if you say, uh, if they say yes, then you say, do you have anything more to add? And it's an incredible way of learning from someone. If you just have a conversation with someone, anyone you meet, and you give it that structure, just say, try this with me. 
I'm just going to ask you like how your day was, and we're going to do this thing back and forth, and you find out things you never would have found in like a vanishingly small amount of time. It's really cool. Um, Michael. Yes. Uh, one thing I noticed about the, the five main uh, rules is it seemed like four of them were like local rules that you could apply like, every time you speak. But the fifth one, story, is kind of a global rule, a constraint on the whole arc. Yes. Um, how, how do you manage to have, take those four first rules, the first four rules, and actually get them to make a story? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. The way that we trained to do it in improv uh, is we would be performing a scene as trainees, not in front of an audience, but with each other. And then um, the person who was training us at some point would shout, find an ending. Um, and then we would have to take all of the little things that we'd been discussing, like all the elements of the scene that had been brought in. Someone's driven in in a car, and someone's come done this, and someone's shot that person, and there's a dead body, and there's this and there's that, and try and tie it up with a bow, uh, and give it, give it sort of a punchy ending. So maybe it's, you know whatever happens to be, like finding those elements and using them to satisfy each person's agenda and then they all are able to go, ta-da, done. Um, so yeah, usually it's like someone outside going, find an ending. Um, now, uh, that's, that's the case when you're training. When you're on stage, you have to have an internal clock um, where you, know, you all have a sense of where the scene is at. And from the very first thing that you do in a scene, you're always keeping track of the possible endings. So um, every time someone comes in, if they clearly have a specific agenda, like they're the king of Rome and they're trying not to get deposed, you know, that becomes part of your like stack of constraints. It's like, well, they either have to be deposed or not deposed by the end, like, or clearly like not deposed for some specific reason or something like that, right? They're either saved or they're sacrificed by the end of the scene and so on it goes for all the other people's agendas. And so you're always trying to find an ending with each thing you do because the shorter the scene is, the better. And in, generally, in general, you actually want to make it as short as possible. Um, not always. Like, we used to do this thing. I don't even know how we did it. But um, I used to do a, this two-hour musical show. And we would have two one-hour halves. And it, um, yeah, I don't know how we did it. But like every night, it was two you halves. Exactly an hour and it tied up with a bow at the end. Um, improvised musicals for an yeah. hour? Oh, yeah. We didn't get to have this discussion when you came in the other yeah. day. Uh, Michael likes musicals. Uh, and I make them up, which is hey, kind don't, of... Don't tell... Don't... Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I was, um, I was endowing you. I was totally made up. You're going to have so many better conversations after this now. It's not all going to be over. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to see Book of Mormon next month. That's right. Me too. Anyway, this is not a talk anymore. This is a conversation. <laughs> um, let's wind it up. Let's tie it up with a book. Find an ending. Find an ending. Okay. Um, so the, the last thing, I just wanted to talk about some of the places that this could be used, because it's not just, I've used programming as an example, uh, but it's not just about programming. Um, you know, you, when you're having discussions in sales, like finding an ending and making the other person look good and all these other things are extremely paramount. And we've done improv in our organization with the sales team and, and the technology team together. And there was just a lot of like, it really harmonizes with like their issues and the things that they need to achieve. Um, and of course, uh, if you how many people here are sort of like entrepreneurs essentially? Um, yeah, quite a few. So if you're an entrepreneur, you know, you need to be the salesperson and the programmer and you need to be constantly selling your idea and, and pitching your idea. Hiring, it's crucially important. Like, it's been so helpful to me, um, I like this talk, just going a little over, to be able to keep discussions to 20 minutes and make sure that you can kind of hit a beat at the end and leave them really enthusiastic uh, and informed and all these other things and also find out a lot about them on the way. Um, because, you know, that's your first impression, uh, those phone screens. Um, uh, leading, I mean, it's kind of obvious if you can if you can get people in your organization uh, to adhere to these principles, it makes them much easier to lead. It makes them much more receptive to each other's ideas, uh, and it makes meetings much more productive. Um, talking to stakeholders, like if you've got someone who needs a feature, you know, being able to to really deeply listen to them and understand them, and also get them to describe that in a sh in a concise way, uh, it's really helpful for that. And then shipping product, I mean, you know, just kind of. Keeps, keeps you focused on always advancing what you're doing uh, and, and getting stuff out there and having a conversation with your customers. Um, so yeah, that's, I think I'm out of time, right? Um, I, I had you slated for half an hour, actually, and you're, you're fine. Sweet. Um, so given all of that, uh, who wants to play, oh, what's that? Just clipped your bow. Um, I'm good. So any last minute questions? Yes. What do you think of Richard Stallman? I've actually spent an evening with Richard Stallman, 
Uh, and I, I really like him, but he's a, he's a strange man. Why do you ask? <laughs> it seems like an antithesis of what you've been talking about. An antithesis? We, we got along too well for, me, for him to be my enemy. Um, yeah, interestingly, he, uh, I said, is there anything you want on your next visit to Australia? Because uh, he, was, he was about to visit Australia. And he said he wanted to meet a friendly parrot. And then he explained that it was because uh, one time he'd been hanging out with a friend and a parrot had made love to his arm. And he wanted to have that experience again. He, is, uh, he hasn't taken a bath since. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, Richard Stallman anecdotes. See me afterwards for those. Yes. Are you at UCB? Uh, am I? Uh, no. I actually want to get back into performing. I, I haven't done that since uh, I was in Australia. Uh, I did a little stand up here, but, but no improv. Well, he's so. not really a good town for that kind of. No, you got to go to Chicago. What? Or... <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah. 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 When you talk to us improv, I'm like, you're in the right town. Yeah, it's true. It is. It's a great town for improv. You know what? If you're good at making shit up, run for office too. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Were there any other any other questions? No. I think firing is a place where improv is more important. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Is that the uh, um, no, Yeah. That's where you know the, all the rules apply. Yes, and yeah. I'm about to shoot. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's the ultimate find an ending. Uh, I'm going to find an ending to your career. <laughs> Get out of town. Um, yes? No, what is next week's Woody Lottery numbers? Uh huh. Um, can I just make them up? Uh, text me later. Can we call me next week? <laughs> um, any other questions about April? All right. Cool. Let's end it there. Thanks, guys.